Good morning. We, this morning, are gathered here remembering, and you'll see this throughout the, uh, the rest of the service, it started with, the, with our, uh, our music this morning, uh, to remember that this is Reformation Sunday. We're going to be talking about the Reformation as we go through the sermon, as we, uh, as we take a look at that, but I just want to kind of bring that to your attention as we start off this morning. Uh, before we get to the rest of that, we do have some announcements, and we have quite a few announcements this morning, so bear with me. I need to make myself a note real quick. Okay. First of all, if you haven't already picked up one of your communion cups, do so. Grab yourself one. It should be on the, uh, in the foyer there on the table. The table got moved, so it's easy to miss them, but they are back there. So grab, if you'll grab one of those, or if you need one of those, uh, Bill would probably throw one to you. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, we will be sharing communion this morning, so uh, if you don't have one, I certainly do need one for when it's time for, for that this morning. October continues to be our Mission Emphasis Month. Uh, just a, a good reminder throughout uh, this entire month of the fact that we are called to be witnesses. And as such, witnesses to this world, witnesses of the fact of Jesus Christ and of the fact of God's grace made active and available to us that we can be set free from the power of sin. That's our witness. That's the message that we take. We are all witnesses. We are all missionaries in the world in which we live. But we also remember that there are opportunities this month especially to, uh, to be reminded of those who are choosing to live as missionaries in other parts of the world. And we're going to get a message from one of those families this morning, one of those families that we, uh, that we support on a regular basis. Uh, Trail Life American Heritage Girls uh, continue to meet. These are, of course, the uh, ministries of our church. These are not groups who come in and rent our facility. These are groups who are actively involved in the ministry of our local church. And uh, as such, we are continuing to support this important uh, children's and youth ministry that, that, uh, that they are for our church and for this community. Uh, if you are, just this, this is just a quick kind of a commercial for them. They have a, a thing that they do every year on Veterans Day, or the, the, actually the Sunday before Veterans Day. And this year, that's next Sunday, uh, November the 6th. And uh, the groups will be meeting, the two troops will be meeting together out at Waco Memorial and placing flags on the graves of veterans. If you are a veteran, it would be great next Sunday at 3.30 if uh, you could show up at Waco Memorial Park. And uh, our, our boys or girls in the troops love the opportunity to, uh, to, to hear your stories and to thank you for your service. And so if you are a veteran, next Sunday, November the 6th, 3.30 over at Waco Memorial Park, uh, the, the troops will be placing flags and uh, would love an opportunity to get to meet all of those who are a part, who have served and who uh, continue to, to serve in different ways. Um, Sam wanted me to, to remind you again that we are inviting everyone to join our Advent Choir. That's November the 27th through the, December the 25th. So we have a month of uh, Advent, and then of course we have Christmas on Sunday this year. We're going to be talking more about that uh, in the weeks to come and letting you know about some stuff that's coming up on Sunday, December the 25th. But an Advent choir, which will be coming together tonight at 6 p.m., first rehearsal tonight, 6 p.m., and you will be then getting the music, doing stuff. If you've sung in the choir in the past, we would love to have you. If you've never sung in a choir here, we would love to have you. If you have, if you sing in the in the in the car, we would love to have you. If you have ever heard anyone sing before, we would love to have you. Are you getting a hint here? We just want you to come and participate and to and to just have fun with the uh, with the Advent Choir. We have some folks who have sung in the past who were not able to do so this year, and so we're trying to fill in some gaps, fill in some holes there. So if uh, if you uh, can be here tonight at 6 p.m. It would be fabulous, and I know Sam would certainly appreciate your attendance for that. Discipleship Sunday, uh, I'm sorry, Discipleship Study meets uh, Wednesday night, 7 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. If you need to be on Zoom, 
we can make that happen. Uh, talk to Sam. If you're not comfortable with Zoom but would rather FaceTime, we can make that happen. If you just want to call somebody and say, hey, put me on speakerphone so I can at least hear what's going on, we can make that happen also. But the best way is for you to be here in person on Wednesday night and uh, to be able to share in the discussion and the things that are going on Wednesday night in the fellowship hall for discipleship study. Um, some folks have already talked to me about this, and so it's, it's out there. I want you to know about what's coming up next Sunday. It is time to fall back with our clocks, and so our time falls back an hour. Uh, someone said, does that mean we have to be here at 9 o'clock for church next week? No, still you'll be here at 10 o'clock. It'll just feel like it's 9 o'clock, so be here next week. Don't forget, Saturday night, set your clock back one hour next Saturday night. Uh, another thing coming up next Sunday at 4 p.m., if you are not a veteran or if you show up to put uh, flags on the graves and then you would like to uh, uh, still have something to do because we have, we'll have an extra like uh, five minutes of uh, before the sun goes down next, uh, next week at 3.30. So uh, if you would like, to, if you would like to, to also then participate in the Greater Waco Thanksgiving service, that'll be at 7th and James Baptist Church. We normally do a Robinson Community Thanksgiving service. Uh, this year, for various and sundry reasons, that's just simply not going to happen. We, we are, we've been unable to get enough of, uh, of the other churches involved in this to actually make it happen for a community Thanksgiving service. And so what we've decided to do is to give you this option to continue to worship and to be thankful. Uh, even though it's not going to be on the week before Thanksgiving, it is billed as a Thanksgiving service. This is the Greater Waco, Greater Waco Thanksgiving service at 7th and James Baptist Church next Sunday at 4 p.m. And I've been told there will be a youth choir. Uh, the folks who sent this out are really promoting it hard. So I encourage you next Sunday evening at 4 p.m. at 7th and James Baptist Church. And uh, if you forgot to set your clocks ahead next week and you're at church early, then, you know, you'll have time again to make it to church on time next Sunday night at 4 p.m. Look at that. Look how we did that. You like that? <sighs> Don't worry. We're halfway done. <clears throat> In order to kind of give our board members a heads up and get it on your calendars, we have a board meeting coming up not this Tuesday, but a week from this Tuesday. So that'll be November the 8th at 7 p.m. here in the church. Uh, it's time, as we said last week, to get into the Christmas spirit. We are doing Operation Christmas Child again this year. Uh, I've seen some boxes already come in. Some folks have already been busy packing boxes and getting them ready and bringing them up here. So the boxes are already here. Uh, those boxes are, are ready to go, and we will be uh, continuing to have boxes flow in. Pick up your boxes. We have plenty of uh, boxes that need to be folded, but pick those up, take them home, take one of the brochures, fill it as full as you possibly can with the different things that are recommended there. Uh, and there are also in the pamphlets different things that are banned. They are forbidden to put into one of the shoe boxes. So uh, please make note of those things as well. Uh, but those shoe boxes will be collected on November the, this is 22nd, is that right? November the 20th. Yeah, on November the 20th. Sorry, I put the wrong date down. They will be collected on November the 20th. It's the Sunday before Thanksgiving. So please make note of that. Uh, last Tuesday morning, uh, I got a, a text. I got a picture from Sam that said, we lost another limb. See the top picture over there? Limb laying out in the parking lot. That's right over here. That, that uh, whole driveway area was blocked and unable to get into from from uh, Old Robinson Road. And so uh, by Tuesday evening, the parking lot's clear. If you came in, if you parked on that side, you th you've never even noticed probably. You might have seen some stuff in the parking lot and you thought, wow, that tree's losing some, losing some leaves. And they look susp suspiciously like sawdust. But that was just simply where the, the limb got cut up. Thank you so much. Uh, all the men of the church who were able to, uh, and one young man, from not in our church who was able to show up and help to uh, clean up and haul away and do all that stuff. And I'm pretty sure that John's goats said thank you so much for the leaves that showed up out in their pasture. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all those who were able to show up and help with that. Um, as that was going on out in the parking lot, we had another thing happening inside. Uh, uh, James and uh, 
John H., since we're on the internet, we're just going to call him that, even though I have a cousin named John H., and it's not him, and sorry. Uh, they were uh, completing the installation of our new thermostats. Uh, these, for those of you who, uh, who wonder who in the world makes it so cold in here every Sunday, or who in the world makes it so hot in here every Sunday, uh, that'd be me. Because up here, there is no air, and it's very warm. And right now, I am very, very warm. But um, I want to thank you for those guys who were, who were able to install and for the donation that was made. Thank you. Thank you for the anonymous donation that was made to have, uh, to have these installed. That was a very helpful part of, uh, of taking care of the building of our local church. So thank you all so much. For those things. I said that we were going to hear from our missionary family. Um, our missionary family is in Slovenia. By a quick show of hands, how many people know where the country of Slovenia is? All right, for both of you who know, for all three of you who know where Slovenia is, I'm impressed because I can never find it on a map. I know that it's somewhere around the Black Sea, and I, half the time I can't even find the Black Sea on the map. So there you go. It used to, when I was in school, it just existed as part of that giant red blob on the map of Asia that was labeled USSR. You probably, most of you remember that. For those of you who don't, talk to me about it after church today and we'll get that straightened out and I'll let you know what happened there. But the, the country of Slovenia was part of what was at one time the USSR. And when that split up, this little country uh, came about. Uh, since they have split, they formed their own government, there is, there's been a lot of turmoil in this country. And we have a group of folks, a, a family of folks, the Persleys, who have uh, been called by God to go into Slovenia and to be there. Our first slide this morning shows, in fact, hang on, Jack, I'm going to move away from this one. Put, turn this, unmute me here. You ready? Can you hear me? So our first slide this morning shows uh, the family. I think when Ryan and Sarah first went over, I don't. I think it was just the two of them, wasn't it? Just the two of them. Uh, they've had both of their children born in Slovenia while they, well, I don't know if they were born there, but both of their children, uh, while the couple was, uh, was, has been in Slovenia, their family has grown. And so now they have, uh, they have the two children who are also part of their ministry there. Next one. Unfortunately, this, unfortunately, you have me as the narrator this morning, so there you go. Uh, one of the things that they wanted to let us know about was the fact that this is a church that has, that has been active and growing, not just their little community church, not just their local congregation, but across the nation. This is a country that really hasn't had, because it was part of the USSR, really hasn't had any kind of church influence uh, for most of the time that it's been around. And so the Christian church is growing by leaps and bounds, but there are also other groups moving in as well. So uh, as the slide says, I don't know if you can read it from where you are, but it says this spring we were able to join with four other churches. We saw eight people baptized, including one young girl from our church. And they go on and say that they have four young people in their church who have placed their faith in Christ. They are now prepared preparing for baptism. And so there is that, that whole process. Uh, when I, the church I grew up in, we called it uh, catechism. Uh, we, we had that. It was training, getting ready for uh, the vow that you were going to take as you joined the church and as you uh, were baptized. Moves on. One of the things that has happened in that part of the world, of course, we, we've heard on the news, uh, the war in Ukraine. And the war in Ukraine has caused uh, a number of refugees in the area. In March, this uh, local church where the Persleys are uh, took supplies to, to the country of Hungary uh, to help with the refugees who had come from Ukraine into Hungary and were overwhelming the refugee center there. Uh, their church continues to support uh, those families who are there, including having one refugee family from the Ukraine who has settled in Slovenia and has now become a part of their church. So continue to pray for that work as well. Uh, summer camps, just like here, 
Uh, summertime is a time to cram in everything that you can possibly do while you still have some, uh, some warm daylight hours. And so summer camp in uh, Slovenia looks like this, which is beautiful. <laughs> uh, they were able to host an English outreach camp, which is an opportunity there to, to bring uh, young people in and to teach them how to speak English. Something that I wish we would do at our camp, actually. That would be, that would be a fabulous thing. Uh, they also had a cowboy camp, which I'm pretty sure was, had nothing to do with the Dallas Cowboys, but uh, I don't know that for a fact. And uh, they were able to do all of this in a local village, and so it, it, it kind of brought attention to the church and to the congregation, but also gave the congregation an opportunity to serve and to instruct in the local village in which, uh, they, in which they served. In addition to those things, they also had their annual children's camp with their own church kids there at uh, probably what we would call a vacation Bible school or something similar to that. So what a great opportunity that they've had over the course of the summer to take care of that. Uh, go ahead. In addition to, uh, to the summertime activities, we also have Bible studies that go on. Uh, continued men's and women's Bible studies occur every week, much like our discipleship study and our Sunday morning worship and, and children's Sunday school happen here weekly. That's what happens there every week. They have made connections through their work over the summer in the community, and in doing so, they've been able to bring folks into, whether it's through their English camp, their cowboy camp, or their children's camp, they've been able to bring in uh, youth and other folks who continue to seek Jesus and to grow as disciples on a weekly basis through the studies that they have. And, of course, they have evangelism. We've seen that, how the evangelism, how the spreading of the gospel the move of, uh, of God goes throughout this entire area, just like it does here. And so you have, uh, as they say, in preparation for Reformation Day, our church has been sharing their faith with others. Uh, in the part of the world in which they live, Reformation Day is a big deal uh, because they're closer to Germany than we are. That's, that's something that, that is a very big opportunity for them to talk about how God has been at work in the past how God is active and at work in the church today and continues to call us to walk with him and to grow in him on a daily basis. And so that is a fabulous opportunity for this family to reach out and for this group then to reach out in evangelism to their area. Uh, because of the evangelism, because of the things they're doing, uh, they have been given a new church space. Sorry, that kind of that one got squished a little bit. Uh, as they say, our church has grown a lot over the past year because of the growth they have been praying for God to provide a new space for our church, for our Sunday worship, and for Sunday school. And God has provided that need. He has answered that prayer. And as of November the 1st, they have moved in. Uh, actually, it's the day after tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> in a day, in, uh, this marks, I guess, the last Sunday that they'll be in their old church. And then they'll be moving into their new facilities on November the 1st. So what an incredible answer for prayer that is. And, of course, finally... Last slide. Thank you. Even though we have, most of us here have never met this family, most of us don't even know where Slovenia is, we are able to help to support the work that's going on, the spread of the kingdom that's going on in that part of the world. So thank you, thank you, they say, for your continued church support and for the work that's going on in Slovenia. Uh, just like the other groups that I hear from on a regular basis, just like the other uh, churches in, in other parts of the world, they will tell you the greatest thing that you can do for the work of the gospel that's going on in, in whatever part of the world they're in, whether it's Romania, whether it's Iran, no matter where it is, the church is growing, the church is, is planted, and the, the kingdom of God is, uh, is on the increase, no matter where that is, the greatest thing. a part of what we're doing here just as much as any
We're going to turn our attention to Psalm, to the Psalm. Oh, yes, ma'am. Mary. <clears throat> yes, I am. Thank you so much. Mary reminded me uh, after or before the service started that the Christmas card list has been placed in the foyer. Uh, the Christmas card uh, mailbox, I guess, I guess that's what we're going to call it, uh, will go up probably in the next week or so. And uh, that will be available for those of you who have never done this or who forget about it from last year, who've forgotten about it from last year. Uh, we take a list. You're welcome to choose the folks that you know. If you want to send a Christmas card to everybody on the list, that's fine. This is a way to kind of cut down on postage. You don't have to mail cards out to everybody in the church. And if you just want to drop them in the slots, that, and you'll see them when they're up there, uh, just drop it in the, in the slot for their name, and we'll be sure to get those cards uh, to it. And there will be announcements over the next few weeks that say, check your mailbox because they're overflowing. The G's and the S's and the F's and the all of those are always overflowing because they just they just do. So there you go. Uh, thank you, Mary, for that for that reminder, and thank you also for getting that list together for us. Certainly appreciate it. <clears throat> Our call to worship this morning comes from the Psalms, Psalm 46. The psalmist writes this: God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Let us pray. Father, so often we hear this verse, or this, this, this psalm rather, and we focus in on one verse, actually part of one verse, where you command us to be still and to know that you are God. Father, we recognize this morning that that does not mean that we are to sit and do nothing. You are not telling us, Lord God, to give up on, on our walk, to, to sit down and to, and to not move forward at all. That's not what that's saying. Father, as long as we have breath in our bodies, as long as we have strength to, to move forward, as long, Lord God, as we have a heart beating in our chest, Father, you call us to walk with you. And as we do so, Father, we wait in holy expectation but we continue, we continue, Lord God, to trust you. Help us, Lord God, to, to know what is just simply busyness for our own glorification or busyness, Lord God, uh, making us feel like we're accomplishing something for you versus waiting in holy expectation. Help us, Lord God, to trust you in every way. Help us, Lord God, to move at the impulse of your love, as the, hymn, as the hymnist wrote. Help us, Lord God, to be ready at a moment's notice to go wherever it is that you send us to continue to preach your message of grace and peace and redemption wherever you place us. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity this morning to come together to lift our hearts, our voices, our minds, our spirits in praise to you, to give back to you, Lord God, 
the praise for all of the ways that you have touched our lives in this past week and beyond. We love you. Thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. As Pastor Jerry announced, uh, we're uh, thinking about Reformation Sunday today. 505 years ago, uh, tomorrow uh, is uh, where we date the Reformation of the church. And uh, so we have that, uh, that theme in mind. And when we think about Reformation, probably the one person we think about is Martin Luther. Uh, you'll see on the back of your bulletin uh, a, a little bit of what Martin Luther's theology and the symbol of that theology was. And uh, uh, you can read that for yourself, preferably not during the sermon today, but, but you can read that and uh, get an idea of some of the thought that goes into Reformation. One of his great hymns, one of Martin Luther's great hymns that's been passed to us is A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Let's stand. And you can turn to number 151 in your hymnals, and we'll sing together, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Let's stand together. <laughs> A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Just ask who that may be, Christ Jesus it is he, Lord Sabbath his name, from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. And though the world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim we tremble not for him, his rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure, one little word shall fail him. That word above all earthly power, no thanks to them abideth. The Spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us bideth. Let goods and kindred grow, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. One of the great promises in Jeremiah's prophecy for us is in the 31st chapter, the verses 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant, which they broke, though I was husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. 
Turn to number 650 in your hymnals and we'll sing, Oh, for a heart to praise my God. This is another Charles Wesley uh, hymn. And so there's a multitude of verses that we don't often sing, and we stuck one in there today, so pay attention to that song. Oh, for a heart to praise my God. Oh, for a heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free, a heart that's sprinkled with the blood so freely shed for me. A heart resigned, submissive, meek, my great Redeemer's throne, where only Christ is heard to speak, where Jesus reigns alone. A humble, lowly, contrite heart, believing true and clean, which neither life nor death can part from him that dwells within. A heart in every thought renewed and full of love divine, perfect and right and pure and good, a copy, Lord, of thine. Thy nature, gracious Lord, impart, come quickly from above. Write thy new name upon my heart, thy new best name of love pronounced together this morning our confession of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is sitting at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And from there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As we go to prayer this morning, I certainly want to make you aware of, of a couple of folks that, uh, that we have on our prayer list. Uh, it is good to have Fred back with us. We've, had, uh, we've been praying for Fred the last couple of weeks, and uh, what, what a pleasure to have him come through his procedure this week and to be able to be back in church with us this morning. We are grateful to God for all that God has brought you through, and so glad that you're back with us this morning, sir. Uh, we do have other folks this morning, folks who aren't with us who normally would be with us. So we do have some folks who are traveling and uh, a few folks who uh, have been sick this past week. I'm not going to mention everybody's names and certainly not going to do that. Many of you already know uh, what's going on in the lives of many folks. I uh, continue to have some folks I want you to be in prayer for. Uh, Anne Mayfield, of course, is still going through her rehab uh, for her knee replacement. I continue to pray for her. Jim and Judy both continue to go through uh, recuperation from surgeries and so continue to be with them as well. Carlita's not with us this morning but she's not sick she's just working so uh, there you go. Rick made her get out and get a job and well she just had to work this morning so uh, uh, certainly be in prayer for uh, for Carlita and don't forget to go vote. There you go. Uh, I was told this morning about uh, Nelda. Uh, Nelda is a friend of, of many of the folks in our church uh, from various places, whether it's the senior center or just simply the fact that you've known Nelda for a long time. Uh, Nelda's uh, going through uh, a, a time where she's having some, uh, some doctor's appointments and some things going on, so uh, we'll certainly be in prayer for her this morning. And, uh, of course, by now you've noticed that Ken Tyndall's not with us this morning. Uh, uh, Sandy is uh, having some procedures done and had to have a test run this morning. In fact, the doctor scheduled that test for 9.30 on a Sunday morning. Wow, what in the world? But uh, 
uh, pray for Sandy as she goes through uh, her tests and then the probable uh, surgical things that are to come after that and for, uh, uh, for her complete uh, recovery uh, from this procedure. So I know that there are others. There always are. There are always things that, for whatever reason, slip my mind or that, that don't get mentioned. Uh, maybe it's things that you're just holding in, in your heart, things that, that only you and God know about. Perhaps you're praying for, for a loved one or a family member. Perhaps you are dealing with, uh, with some things yourself, a need for repentance, uh, an opportunity uh, to ask God to, to forgive you and to, and to restore relationship in your life. Perhaps that's what you bring this morning as we come to the altar, as we come to God's throne. Whatever it is that you bring, God is able to, to take and to hear and to answer that prayer. God is able to bring newness, to bring re not only renewal, but revival, and even reformation where needed as we come before him. Let's pray. Father, this morning we come to you, yes, with requests. We ask, Father, for, for your hand in each of these things that we've mentioned. We pray, Father, for your will to be done. But, Father, we also come to you knowing full well that we stand in constant need of your grace. That we, Lord God, are needy people. That we, Father, first and foremost, bring to you our own weaknesses, our own issues, our own struggles. And we lay those down at your feet and we say, Father, help us. Father, forgive us. Where there is a need, Father, for restoration with you, we ask, Father, that this morning that that restoration may be found. Where there is a need, Father, where you've placed someone else upon our mind and our spirit this morning, uh, where we need to forgive someone else. We ask, Father, that you will help that to happen. Perhaps, Father, we are the ones who have said something, who have done something in a way that perhaps caused an unintentional, an unintentional heart in someone else. If so, Father, then may you lay that upon our minds so that we may go to that person and seek their forgiveness. And again, Father, be restored to fellowship. Whatever it is, however it is, Lord God, that you need to work this morning to bring about your forgiveness and your restoration in our lives, we ask, Father, that you will do that, that you will accomplish what you need to, to accomplish for you, for your glory this morning. We recognize, Lord God, that you call us to live a Christian life. And that doesn't mean just to show up in church on Sunday. That doesn't mean just to write a check whenever, whenever we're supposed to. But, Father, that means to live every single day as a reflection of what we know to be true about you to the rest of the world. And so, Father, we ask this morning that you will, that you will equip us and empower us to do that very thing, that you will remind us, Lord God, that the words that we speak carry weight, that our actions, Lord God, are influential, we live in a world of influencers, Lord God, whether they're on TV or the Internet or whether they're in our own lives. And so we pray, Lord God, that you will help us, use us, Lord God, to influence the lives of others around us. Influence them, Lord God, not to do our will, but help us, Lord God, to be an influence for you, that your will may be done, that you may be known in all things. Father, we do lift up these needs that we've mentioned to you this morning. We pray for Nelda. We pray for Sandy. We pray, Father, for those who are recuperating, recovering from surgeries and from illnesses. We pray, Father, that you will continue to be with them and give them the strength, the help, the hope that they need as they are trusting you every day. We ask, Father, that you'll be with those who are traveling, that you'll see them home safely again to us. And we thank you, Lord God, that in all things that you are the God who provides that you are the God who meets every need. Thank you, Father. Thank you for being the living, active, holy, loving God. Hear us now as we join our hearts and our voices together, praying as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel of John, John chapter 8. 
I'm going to make Sam laugh for just a moment. One of my favorite chapters in the book of John. <laughs> Sorry, they're all good. I just, I, every week I say, I have a new favorite. John chapter 8, starting in verse 31. <clears throat> then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin or is committing sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Let's stand and let's sing again together. Break thou the bread of life. Number 413 in your hymnals. Let's stand together and sing this great hymn of the church. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me, as thou didst break the loaves beside the sea. Beyond the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord, my spirit pants for thee, O Break thou the bread of life, O Lord, to me, that hidden in my heart thy word may be. Mold thou each inward thought from self set free, and let my steps be all controlled by thee. Open the word of truth that I may see thy message written clear and plain for me. Then in sweet fellowship, walking with thee, thine image on my life engraved with Bless thou the truth, dear Lord, to me, to me. As thou didst bless the bread by Galilee, then shall all bondage cease, all fetters fall, and I shall find my peace, my all in all. O oh, send thy spirit, Lord, now unto me, that he may touch my eyes and make me see. Show me the truth concealed within thy word, and in thy book revealed I see the Have a seat, and we'll invite our pastor to come and break the bread for us this morning. As we have said, today is recognized in the church world as Reformation Sunday. October 31st, 1517 was the date that Martin Luther, who was pastor of the Catholic Church in Wittenberg, Germany, and also professor of moral theology at the University of Wittenberg, nailed 95 theses, or propositions, if, if that helps that word to be better understood, to the door of the church. He did this because it was, not because it was Halloween and because there would be people coming to the church for trunk or treat that night. He did it because the next day was All Saints Sunday, which, by the way, next Sunday is All Saints Sunday. 
we get to talk about that next week. And so, these 95 propositions that were nailed to the wall were meant to get people thinking and talking and praying about the problems of immorality and greed that were openly being practiced in the Catholic Church in Martin Luther's day. There were people who called for reform in the church before Luther nailed those 95 theses or propositions to the door. And there were people who continue to this day to call for reformation in the church. But Luther's act is recognized as the beginning of the Protestant movement and the separation then of many groups from the Catholic Church. It's appropriate that our sermon text today is from the book of Romans. Augustine, a great thinker of the church prior to Luther, gave testimony that it was Paul's letter to the Romans that led Augustine to turn away from a self-centered life of sinning and to turn to God. Luther himself wrote that it was while reading Paul's letter to the Romans that God impressed upon Luther's mind and spirit that salvation from sin and sinning is by grace and not through the following of the ritual of the church. John Wesley himself testified that God brought Wesley to repentance while hearing Luther's introductory remarks to Romans being read. This letter, this letter of Paul to the church in Rome, breathed into Paul's mind. God used Paul as the instrument to write this letter, and it has been and continues to be profoundly important to the church. So, all of this historical information I know some people like and other people could care less about. Preacher, get past the history. I'm tired of hearing about it. Dates bore me. Get past all that. Get to what you really need to tell us this morning. Okay. I will. This historical information, though, is important for us to hear and to remember because it brings us today into the story. It's not just about what happened, what did we say, 405 years ago. 505 years ago. See, that's why Sam's here to do math for me. 505 years ago. It's, it's so much more than just what happened half a millennia ago. It's what is continuing to happen in the church today as we continue to hear and to respond to the voice of God. This does still affect us. And Romans chapter 1 continues to teach us and to instruct us. And we're going to see how both of these things are true. We're going to start with Romans this morning. We're going to read and work our way through Romans chapter 1, verse 1 through 7. Every time that it's time to preach out of the book of Romans, whether it's uh, for uh, a class, whether it's uh, for a Sunday sermon, it always troubles me that we only get a couple of verses, that we only get a piece of a passage that we look at. Maybe it's from Romans 3, maybe it's from Romans 5, maybe it's from Romans 13. Whatever it is, we usually only get a small chunk out of one of the verses, out of one of the chapters, and only a few verses then of that chapter. And so it's hard for us to see the continuity. But Paul's message to the church starts here in Romans chapter 1. And in fact, everything then that we read after this point, we can come back to. And we can say, how is it? That God continues to instruct us. Well, it's because we are those who are called to be saints. How is it that God continues to use us? Well, it's because God is the one who calls us into the work of a witness. All of those things, all of those ideas are found right here in this chapter, in these opening seven verses of this letter. And so we're going to spend some time this morning going through. It's going to get a little technical at times. Bear with me. We're going to have plenty of things up on the wall in order to pay attention. Take notes out, get ready, because here we go. <clears throat> we start in Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before, through his prophets in the Holy, in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him, through Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, 
among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, if we start there in the opening word, there are three things that Paul says about himself, three ways that he describes himself to this church. Most scholars believe that Paul might not have known many of the people in this church, that he had, according to the book of Acts, not yet been to Rome. Perhaps. Perhaps he knew more than we, than we think he knew. Perhaps he knew more of the people. Perhaps this, there are a lot of perhapses in, in uh, Paul's life. We've been talking about those in, uh, in our Wednesday night discipleship study. But Paul, first of all, describes himself as a bond servant. The word in Greek is doulos. And it literally means slave. Specifically, a, a person who has chosen slavery, not necessarily one who has been born into slavery. Could be, but in Paul's mind, he was born into a condition of sin that he had inherited from Adam. This is, come, this is later in the book. You guys know this. You've heard this before. He was born into a condition of sin that had been inherited from Adam. And so there was a change when Paul now was no longer a slave to sin, but now he says, I have chosen to be a servant to God, a bond servant. He has placed himself into servanthood under God. This was a big deal. Slavery was a big deal in the ancient world. Uh, that's really how most of the economy worked and ran in, in Paul's day. Uh, but a bond servant had the opportunity to work off his indebtedness. In more recent history from Paul's, from Paul's day, there were men and women who chose to be indentured servants in order to get from parts of Europe to America, that they might start a new life, that they might earn money and bring their families to this new world. This is what Paul has in mind when he calls himself a bond servant, one who has chosen to take the yoke of servanthood upon himself. Paul also says that he is called to be an apostle. The term apostle was reserved for those who had been called by and walked with Jesus during his earthly ministry. It means, the word there in the Greek means messenger, literally one who is sent with a message. After the death of Judas, you remember that the remaining 11 apostles chose a replacement for Judas, and his name was Matthias. For those of you who answered that in your head, good job. For those of you who went, they did? I don't remember that happening. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 1, go back and read that this, this next week. But the important thing is, we never hear anything from Matthias again. God, though, chooses a new apostle. God chooses Paul. Just a few chapters later in the book of Acts, as, as Paul is traveling down the Damascus Road, he meets Jesus face to face. And it's after that encounter where Jesus chooses Paul to fill the place that's left vacant by Judas, that Paul then becomes this apostle, this sent one, this one who has a message to the Gentile world. He is the one then sent to declare this gospel, this good news of what God is doing through Jesus to the Gentile world. Next, Paul says he is separated to the gospel of God. This is Paul's way of saying that God had set Paul apart. Uh, technically, that word separated there means sanctified, to be set apart for holy use, for a specific holy purpose. Paul then is saying that I have been, my life has been set apart from the things in this life, who I used to be, my, my former self-centered aspirations, my, my former zealous activity. Paul says I've been set apart from those things and set apart to God to live and to preach and to teach the good news that God's salvation from sin, sins and sinning, has come in Jesus Christ. Verse 2 moves us into a different focus. Not about Paul, but about Jesus. 
It's not a new sentence. I want you to notice here. It doesn't start with the capital up there. This is a long sentence. Paul is known for his really, really long and complex sentences. And so verse 2 continues the sentence that he started back in verse 1. But we find in verse 2 that our attention is being focused not on Paul, because Paul doesn't want to make himself the center of attention, but upon Jesus, upon the message of what God is doing in Christ. Paul declares why Jesus is worthy of being served. Paul says, I've chosen to become a bondservant. I've chosen to make myself a slave to God through Jesus Christ. And here's why, he says. Jesus is worthy of being served. Because Jesus was not only a prophet, but he was foretold of by the prophets. Jesus was not only a leader, but Jesus also was a direct descendant of Israel's greatest leader, King David. Jesus was a teacher, but more than only a teacher. By his declaration of, of, of God's truth, by the way that he preached, by his death, his resurrection, and ascension, he was proven to be God in human form. Paul says all of that here, declared to be son of God, of the seed of David, um, uh, pro- promised before through the prophets and the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Scriptures, all of these things. Paul says, these are reasons why Jesus is worthy to be served. Why it's okay for me to surrender my life to him and to give him my life as his bondservant. All of these things, Paul says, declare that Jesus is more than worthy enough to dedicate one's life to one's service. Since God and Jesus are the same, right? I'm Trinitarian here. Different forms of the same God. Serving Jesus then equals serving God. All of this discussion then brings us into verse 5. Through him, what Paul writes there in verse 5, can also be translated as in him or in Jesus. This is where Paul receives grace and apostleship. Grace is the power of God seeking those who will respond to God. Grace is, the, is God's power to save. God's power to sustain the human spirit from the power of sin. God's power to empower and to equip us to follow God wherever God leads us. It's by God's grace Paul has been called and established as an apostle. And the message that Paul brings to the nations is not his own, but is God's message. Remember, Paul is only the servant. Verse 5 continues by revealing the scope of God's invitation. God's grace is extended to all nations. While we have less of an issue with this statement today, this was a radical idea for many Jewish people who follow Jesus. They, like Paul, and we see this throughout the book of Acts, is it right? Is it okay? Doesn't it somehow offend God? Doesn't it go against God's covenant promise to bring Gentiles into the church? That's why Paul was sent as an apostle to the Gentiles. That's why Peter was given this vision coming down from heaven of the great sheet that opened up and God declaring that everything is made clean by God. We have here God's stamp of approval upon the ministry to all the nations of the world. But many of the Jewish followers of Jesus, like Paul, had been raised, had been taught that the nations of the world, the non-Jews, We're not worthy of God's love, of God's blessing, of God's salvation. But God revealed to Paul that God's invitation for salvation extends beyond nationalistic boundaries. Later on in this letter and in some of Paul's other letters, we learn that God used Paul's own conversion, that God used the time spent with non-Jewish believers, and God used all of these things to continue the shaping of Paul's mind and Paul and Paul's will in order to demonstrate to Paul just how short-sighted the idea was that God's grace is only available to a select few people. God's grace is available, as Jesus said, as we heard in John 3.16 just a few weeks ago, to whosoever will receive him. Just as God's grace reformed Paul's thinking, God's grace changed the Christians in Rome as well. Where once they were slaves to sin, God has set them free from the power of sin to also be servants of God. Where once they were enemies of God and children of Satan, God has invited or called them 
uh, through Jesus to be God's children. What a great reminder that God is always accomplishing what is best for God through the lives of everyone who is walking with God. While God's grace was made available through Jesus to all people in every nation, Paul knew that this church specifically was in Rome. Rome was the world power in the first century. The influence of Roman culture was everywhere. If you were a Roman citizen, you had rights. If not a, if not a citizen, you had no rights. Rome, through the persecutions leveled against Christians by many of the Roman emperors, became uh, a great force which was opposed to the church. And in fact, later on, the empire, the Roman empire, would be compared to Babylon and to the actions that Babylon had against God's people in the Old Testament. So too then, John uh, the Revelator would say that, that Babylon the Great has fallen, and in reference then to that world power which everyone understood and everyone could see was Rome. These followers of Jesus who were living in Rome, living for Christ, were living in one of the most dangerous places in the world in the first century. These witnesses living in Rome, in Rome though, are called the beloved of God. Not because they're more important, but because these are those who, even though the emperor was demanding that they worship the emperor as God, the people in this church were choosing to worship God as the one true living God. The people in this church would have known what Paul meant when he used this phrase. when He was referring to them as the beloved of God. It meant that, their, that what they received in life did not come from the emperor's hand, but it came instead from God's hand. How they lived their life then was in not in submission only to the emperor, but also in submission first and foremost to God through faith in Jesus Christ. Hopefully you remember that God's eternal purpose is to love and be loved by free moral choice. That's what these folks were doing, even though they were living in the most dangerous place in the world for them. Because we continue to know God's eternal purpose, because God continues to love us by free moral choice and to help us to love Him by free moral choice. When we are called beloved by God, we are reminded that we are living in an active relationship with God through faith in Jesus. In addition to being beloved by God, these Roman followers were also called saints. We have that. Go back. Second, I'm sorry, Zach, I hate to do that to you. Uh, notice there's two words there in Romans 7, 7. Beloved and saint. To be beloved by God is to recognize God's worth, to, be, to no longer be enslaved to sin, but instead walking with God in a relationship, which changes everything about your life then. You are then called saint. Thanks, Clay. You can go bring that other one back up. The idea, though, of being called saints is a difficult thing for us to kind of wrap our heads around. Over the centuries, two schools of thought have arisen concerning the word translated there as saint, the word hagios. First of all, some leaders in the church came to believe that because they were leaders in the church, they were holy. It was their office, their position, their power that made them holy. By the way, most of the reformers had to deal with that kind of attitude, whether it was Luther with uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church, whether it was uh, uh, Wesley with the Anglican Church. No matter who it was, there were those leaders in the church who had this idea. Well, we are the holy ones. We are the ones who, in right, who are in right standing with God because we are clergy, because we are in whatever office of the church. And everyone else, then, is unholy. That's a very wrong misunderstanding of what Paul is writing here. The second idea, the second wrong idea about this word, often because of the first, the attitude of the first group, many people then who followed in the footsteps of those reformers over the years started teaching that it's not possible for a human being to be holy in this life because we are in this human body. The problem is the scriptures keep telling us the same thing over and over again at least 16 times the last time I counted. Be holy as God is holy. 
since the holiness of God's people then is commanded by God that we are to reflect God's holiness, we are being made holy by God in order to reflect God's holiness to the world around us. Holiness must include more than just the leaders. Holiness must include everyone. This term, saints, these hagioi, are those who have been forgiven of his or her sins. Those who are walking in relationship with God. Those who are choosing to live as servants to God. Just as Paul was set apart to be an apostle, all followers of Jesus are set apart from sin, from sins, from sinning by God's grace. And we must continue to grow in relationship with Christ Jesus. We are then made holy, not by our performance, not through our own power. We are made holy by the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within us. That is such an important distinction, something that we must hold on to, something that we must never forget. This is God's work. This is not our own work. We are not made holy because of our position, because of what other people call us, because of any little prefix of letters in front of or behind our name. We are holy as we are walking in relationship with God. And that invitation to walk is extended to all the nations of the world. Whosoever will hear and respond to God's voice. So this morning, I look across the sanctuary of saints. If you are hearing and responding and choosing to love God more than the things of this world, then you are called a saint of God. Whether you like it or not, whether it troubles you or not, whether you say, well, you just don't know the things that are going on in my life. No, but God knows. And if there's anything that disqualifies you from being called that, if there's anything that disqualifies you from living in that relationship with God through Jesus Christ, then this morning is the morning to pray for forgiveness that God may restore you and may use you as one of his holy people. As you can see, through these just seven verses, there are some incredible ways that God's work to redeem humanity from sin is being described here. It's a little wonder that the church reformers of the past were so influenced by this letter to the Romans. But to go back to our previous question, what does the Reformation and this passage have to do with us today as we follow Jesus? We have to come to some certain conclusions about that. Like Martin Luther and others who have come before us, we who follow Jesus today find ourselves living in a time when the church needs a good dose of reforming. These are dangerous times in which we live, just as they were for, for the Roman Christians, just as they are for us here today. Yes, it might not seem like we have as much overt persecution here as what some people do, some brothers and sisters in Christ in other parts of the world. As those churches are meeting today in China or in North Korea or in any of the Muslim countries, Muslim-controlled countries in the world. There is a danger. There's an overt danger for them, and they know that, and yet they continue to meet. They meet, they pray together, they share together, they read Scripture together with the fear that there might be those who break in and drag them away to prison. We don't have that fear, but yet our culture still makes it unsafe and unpopular to live a life that is fully submitted to Christ Jesus, to live flat like a holy follower of God. The problems with hearing and responding to God's voice that, sorry, that occurred uh, in Martin Luther's day had occurred long before Martin Luther's day. And in fact, those same issues, those same troubles continue to creep into our church today. In Paul's day, the teachers of the people had to be told that their refusal to see God's work through Jesus was a contradiction to God's redemptive plan. God equipped and he raised up Paul, not to start a new religion, but to show that God's message through Moses, through the Torah, through the prophets, found completion in Jesus. Jesus was the answer to all of God's promises. In Luther's day, the church became more focused on gaining and holding political power than it was focused on understanding God and living in this world as disciples of Jesus. And so God equipped and raised up Luther to bring the church back to God 
in the way that God reveals himself in the scriptures and in our day to day. There are many who claim the name of Jesus as their Savior, but choose to not live with Jesus as their Lord. To try to do this turns the relationship with the living, holy God into a mockery. There are many today who are seeking to reshape God in their own image, who want to make God more user-friendly, more in touch with the politics of today. These are wrong ideas. This is the wrong way to live as a Christian. To live as a Christian does not mean reshaping God to make him more friendly and more, more available to us. It means that we allow God to reshape, to reform our lives, our minds, our spirits, so that God is then reflected, so that God's holiness, his justice, his love, are all reflected back to the world through what God has done in our lives. God's purpose with this local church, with our denomination, and with all who are choosing in the church today to live as the people of God. God's purpose is for his people to be an agent of of reformation to the world. God equips us through the renewal of our minds and our lives God uses our witness to show that God, that being God's people is not a part-time choice, but a full-time commitment. God is giving us a story to tell, a testimony that God's grace and power is able to deliver everyone from the power of sin and the certainty of eternal spiritual death. Through continued faith in Jesus, God makes it possible to live in full submission and full obedience to God, knowing God making him known to all who seek him. I don't know. This is a long sermon. There were a lot of things, lots of notes. I know that we had a lot of things to go over this morning, just in those first seven verses of the book of Romans. But all of those things this morning, I pray, are brought together in your mind, in your spirit, by the Holy Spirit. And if there is anything, any way at all, that God needs to reform, to reshape, to renew, to revive in you some aspect of your Christian life. This morning is the perfect time for that to happen. And these altars are open for you to come and pray as we join together in our final hymn. This morning we'll be sharing the Lord's Supper together. And part of that symbolism is that being in Christ, sharing Christ together. We're going to sing the song number 753 in our hymnal, Come Share the Lord. Uh, Stand with us as we sing, and let's keep that image in mind, sharing the Lord together. We gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. Through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here. Everyone belongs. Finding our forgiveness here, we in turn. Forgive all wrongs. He joins us here. He breaks the bread. The Lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread. Come drink the cup. Come share the Lord. We are now a family of which the Lord is head. No one seen he meets us here in the breaking of the bread. We'll gather soon where angels sing. We'll see the glory of our Lord and coming King. Now we anticipate the week for which we wait. Come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord.
In our gospel passage that we read earlier from John chapter 8, Jesus had declared that he is the bread of life, the food that had come down from heaven, the bread which was rejected by those who were choosing not to believe in him, not to surrender fully to his lordship. This morning as we have this bread, as we have this little wafer that represents the body of Jesus, the body that was broken for us, we remember as we receive this, as we eat it, as it goes into our body and becomes a part of us, we also remember that God has invited us to become a part of him through faith in Jesus. Let us not reject the bread of heaven. Let us instead invite the bread of heaven to come and to fill our lives in every way, to shape us, to mold us, to use us for God's glory. Take and eat. One of the great passages in, in Paul's letter to the Romans is found in Romans chapter 7, which talks about how God has cleansed us from all sin in order to restore us. It talks about the idea of trying to live in two worlds and trying to live in the past and still be married to sin and live as a Christian and how that's impossible because God has delivered us from that. He is we have died to sin that we might be alive in Christ. It is the image then, the symbol of the blood of Jesus that has washed away our sins that we remember this morning. For it's as Jesus washes away our sins that he releases us from bondage to sin and makes it possible for us to have new life with God through faith in Jesus take and drink. Let us pray. Father, in the sermon of the bread and the juice, we find that once again you are calling us to fully surrender to you, to find in you, Lord God, our purpose. Our purpose, Lord God, is not to bring glory to ourselves as the world teaches but instead, Lord God, to bring glory to you, to reflect to the world what we know to be true about you, and to reflect back to you, Lord God, the glory that only you deserve, for you are the one who has released us from the power of sin. You are the one who has provided a relationship with you through faith in Jesus. You are the one, Lord God, who sends us out with a message to tell. You are the one, Lord God, who brings your revival, your renewal to our lives that you might then send us out as agents of reformation into the world in which we live. Thank you, Father, for the work that you have done here this morning, for the work that you will be doing in our lives and through us in the week to come. Thank you, Father, for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Our dismissal hymn today is Make Me a Servant. Let's take this song with us as we leave today. Make me a servant, humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up those who are weak and may the prayer of my heart always be make me a servant make me a servant make me a servant today make me a servant humble and meek Lord let me lift up servant, make me a servant, make me a servant today.
just go be servants today. You're dismissed.